Life is made up of experiences. Experiences shape our perspectives and allow us to pass along knowledge. In this podcast, I sit down with listeners like you and find out that no matter who you are, everyone has a story to tell. I'm Ethan Smith, and this is Life Experienced. Our guest today is Greg Lambert, a chemical engineer who returned to graduate school after working in industry for a few years. His graduate studies are now drawing to a close as he expects to finish this fall. I sat down with Greg and asked him about his path to graduate school. Growing up, people always say to you, what do you think your life is going to be like in 10 or 15 years or something like that? And so from where you are right now, looking back on, you know, how 10 or 15 year old Greg might have answered that question, how do you think your perspective has changed? Drastically. I would not have been a uh, scientist by any means. I would have been like a, a video gamer, maybe drumming or something, but definitely not getting a PhD, doing like 20 years of schooling. I was, I was done at 10, <laughs> but for some reason I just decided to keep going. Okay, so what do you think it was that actually made you decide to keep going? <laughs> so I was actually thinking about this on the ride over. Um, so a big, inf- a big inspiration for going into science in the first place was um, my AP Chem class. Um, really, not so much the class, but there was a little story in our textbook about the Haber process. I don't, I don't know how, how many people know about the Haber process, but it's made by a guy called Fritz Haber. I'm not going to hide it. He was a Nazi scientist, a very problematic dude. But uh, the Haber process itself was pretty cool. So it's like middle of World War II. The Nazis have been you know, completely, what's the word, blockaded from the outside world. And they need ammonium, or sorry, nitrogen to blow people up. So uh, in looking for new sources of nitrogen... Haber eventually came onto the idea of the um, like Le Chatelier's principle, where you can use different temperatures and pressures to manipulate equilibrium, and he used all of this to pluck nitrogen out of the air and then turn it into ammonium, which you can actually use. It's definitely a problematic because they're using it to kill people, and it undoubtedly extended the war by at least a year or so. But what really struck me was the profound impact that it had on the world after the fact, because this was maybe not so much anymore, but back in the day, it was the primary source of ammonium for fertilizer. So what started out as a way to kill a bunch of people ended up being able to feed thousands and thousands of times over more people. And it was really just the scope of the impact of that kind of being able to apply science to some broader production scale thing, which is what really drove me to go into chemical engineering and then just to keep going with a PhD. Greg completed his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering and entered the job market. I asked him about what motivated his return to graduate school after working for a while. After you did your undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, you went to work in industry. Yeah. So what made you decide to come back to graduate school? So when I graduated, I was up in the air about industry and research. I figured that grad school is always there. It'll always be there if I get tired of industry, so I might as well just go into industry first. Of course, I was uh, unemployed for about a year, and I did eventually come up on a, uh, a job at a startup down in Danville. They're no longer around, but their whole deal was they take wood chips, they digest them in acid, and turn them into sugar. And you can use that sugar to do all sorts of things. They made jet fuel out of it. Uh, they used some of the leftover material to spin carbon fibers. So it was, it was a really cool, sustainable way of doing a whole bunch of really neat things. But um, they essentially ran out of money. I would have stayed on with them for a few more years. But, uh, yeah, they ran out of money. They eventually went out, went under a few years later. But they had to let me go. And they let me go just in time to put in my grad school applications. So I decided, yeah, well, I might as well go for the Ph.D. now. Greg will soon enter the job market again, which will most likely lead him to another area of the country. Moving is often a source of stress for some people, but for others like Greg, it may actually be a way of life. All of my guests, I try to have at least one thing that I know about them that I think might be interesting for topic of discussion. For you, it's the fact that you move a lot, or (laughs) you have moved a lot. 
So <laughs> if you could start at the very beginning and kind of tell us, set up the background, set up the the context and explain how that affected your life growing up. Right. So I guess a very long time ago in a state very far away, uh, Alabama to be specific, I was born in Montgomery and then we moved roughly a week or two after that out to Mountain Home in Idaho. And oh, first off, we're doing all this because my dad's in the Air Force, not because we're insane. But So he's in the Air Force. He's moving around to all sorts of bases. After Mountain Home, we go to Clovis, New Mexico for about four years. And then we fly out to Hawaii. Uh, we're in Mililani for a little bit, and then we're in Hickam Air Force Base. And all this is on the, not the big island, but Oahu, which is the main island where everybody actually lives. Uh, after that, we moved back to the States to beautiful Alabama again. <laughs> and then we moved up to Maine for reasons I still don't fully understand. But because there's no Air Force Base or anything there. And then we ended back up, we ended back in um, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Beautiful Fayetteville, North Carolina. And then we ended up back here in uh, in Virginia. Uh, down in Pocosin, right ne- was where we moved and did high school. And that's like a little fishing community, which is, it wants to, still desperately wants to believe that it's a small town, but it's surrounded by all sorts of, it's surrounded by Hampton Roads, basically, which is one of the big economic centers here in Virginia. And yeah, that's and then you know I've moved around Virginia too. And in Blacksburg, I've been at Danville, which is my first job, and Pocosin. So I've been even even when we're supposedly stopped moving, I still managed to jump around somewhere. How commonplace did this become? Like, what what was it like when you were a kid when your dad said, "Hey, we're moving again"? <laughs> well. <sighs> When I was younger, I didn't care. I was, I was a stupid little kid. Okay, I made friends, and then that was it. But as I got old, as we kept doing this over and over and over again, I continuously lose really good friends, and as I continuously forget about really good friends, it's, it did start to take a toll on me a little bit. Not so much, not so much outwardly, but just I kind of got over the whole getting getting to a new place, being the new guy, and then having to make new friends again. I kind of stopped making new friends once I got to high school. It's, you know, to, to end this on a you know, really high note. <laughs> With the exception of losing a few items here and there, Greg couldn't recall a specific instance of something odd or exciting happening during the moves. However, he does recall an event that changed his perspective. After we moved, when we were living in New Mexico, I had really close friends, and you know, we played together all the time, video games, playing outside and all that. And then we moved to Hawaii for about a year and a half or so. We never really talked because this was way before this is before we would have known how to use AOL and like the internet was still like in the part of the government work. It was still top secret stuff. Or Al no, sorry, Al Gore was still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think Tim Berners Lee might be might have just heard that <laughs> somewhere somewhere across the earth. Yeah. So yeah, I never talk never talked to her for like over the course of this month over the course of the few years. And then we've come back, and on our way to Alabama, we stopped by in New Mexico, you know, to meet up with old friends and everything. So we're hanging out a little bit. We're at the pool, or the public pool on base. And, you know, we're playing together for a little bit. And then she has another friend there hanging out with the, him, us as well. And at one point during the talk, I overheard her saying, I was like, oh, I gotta go, I have to go back and you know, play with my friend a little bit. But, you know, in that way, it was like, oh, I have to go back and play with this friend because it's been so long and my mom says that I have to, you know. <laughs> so when I was a kid, obviously, that, that stung. And I was upset and everything. And I was kind of mad. But as I've as I've gotten older and started to reflect on things a little bit more, it, it's helped me to understand just how important it is to really put time and energy into your relationships. Like, you, you don't get a... You don't get free lunches. You don't get a free relationship with people. They don't. You can't expect to just drop out of somebody's life for a year, year and a half, five years, and then expect to just walk back in as though nothing's happened. So it's it's something that staying in contact with people is something I've struggled with my entire life, and it's still something I want to do to this day because of what happened back then. The United States currently has over one million active military personnel many with families. This means that there are many kids out there growing up just like Greg did. 
I asked Greg what advice he would give them if he could. Um, well, as a kid, you just have to take it. You don't get any choice in the matter. Uh, Uncle Sam matters a little more. Not that Uncle Sam matters more to your parents, but Uncle Sam pays the bills. So <laughs> you got to go where Uncle Sam wants you to go. Um, the best thing you can do is just to recognize that basically everything in this life is temporary. Like, even the most important things, like our relationships with family, significant others... It's all temporary. Everybody dies. <laughs> Not. J I just keep seeing the dragging this back into a, a dark mire. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just just understanding that everything is temporary and it's okay to feel sad when this is all done because that means that you put a lot of time in a relationship and you you've enjoyed you've had a good time if you're feeling sad by the end of it because it means that the place is just really connected with you. Um, unlike some of my later moves where I just didn't care anymore. <laughs> After his move to Maine when he was 10, Greg began a hobby that has remained constant in his life to this day. He learned to play the drums. Right, so I started playing the actual drum set. I didn't do band or anything in school. This was before we had requirement for that. So I actually played the drum set with a, an older guy who was like a jazz drummer in a, a local Lewiston, Maine band that I don't know, probably doesn't exist anymore. So I learned that I learned some of the basics, like how to actually hold the sticks and play and read music and all that. And it was basic, very basic, classic percussion stuff and, you know, some basic backbeats. Then we moved on and, see, turn of the century, late turn of the century, like early 2000s, I was big into Linkin Park, um, corn, Limp Biscuit, that kind of stuff. So very heavy music, very terrible music <laughs> but um yeah so that's what i got into and then i was at that time i was in middle school and we started to band my parents were like oh you have to play something you have to either do art or band or some other thing like that so i did band because i played the drums already and that was fun and we did a lot of classical music there uh, in high school we also played a lot of classical music and that's where i met the bassist for the first band i played with and he was a trumpet player and he was a really, he's the complete opposite from me. He's like super gregarious and outgoing. He just walked up to me once. I was like, hey, dude, I know you play the drums. You're pretty good. You want to play in my band? It was like, oh. I thought it was like, let me think about it. And then he came back later. It's like, dude, come on, yeah. play in my band. It's like, okay, fine. I'll play in your band. And we did. Uh, we did um, more like the pop punk, the classics, like Blink-182, Yellow Card, stuff like that. We called ourselves the Membership Card. And uh, our first show my first show ever from this band was uh, we were in the middle of a warehouse in Virginia Beach. It's just like this a warehouse that had an empty space during the weekends. It was like here, you can. They had like a, sh a show where multiple bands would come and they'd play. So that was really cool. We were like, oh, we gotta come back here, do a uh, do a music video. We'll have like sparks flying everywhere, dust coming up. You know, oh yeah, it'll be awesome. And that that was that was pretty fun. And then we did some other birthday parties and shows like that. How many people do you think attended your shows back then? <laughs> um, well, that show, we had a decent amount because it was a bunch of different bands. It was about a, two dozen people, maybe. And then we had a captive audience with the birthday parties. <laughs> we had plenty of people. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, you know, playing in high school, playing in the actual bands at high school, we had all the, the families, you know, they have to attend. So I've always been able to perform in front of a decent amount of people. So I've never really had a problem with stage fright. Sure. Really. With the end of his graduate program in sight, there was just one more question that I had to ask. What do you think you want to do after you finish? Go where the wind blows? Move <laughs> around a lot? I, I'm sure I'll end up moving around a lot more. I, I get antsy just staying in one place. I'm ready to leave Virginia. <laughs> um. But it's bigger picture. I would like to do work that has a bigger impact. Um, a lot of the work I do serves uh, making light weighting vehicles and then, you know, improving fuel economy, reducing emissions and all that. And I'd like to be involved a little bit more in doing or bringing sustainability into industry, making being able to find things that are come from a sustainable feedstock. And just overall trying to make this place a little bit better when my kids or grandkids have to take over. 
Hopefully, Greg will end up working somewhere he can make a difference, even if it does involve moving. I hope Greg's story will be an encouragement to anyone who faces similar circumstances, and we wish him the best moving forward. Life Experienced is hosted and produced by Ethan D. Smith and is primarily distributed via D Sound, a decentralized audio sharing platform built on the Steam blockchain. For more information, visit dsound.audio. The music in this podcast is composed by Lee Rosevere and used under Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. For more information, visit freemusicarchive.org. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you like the podcast, be sure to share it with others. If you have an interesting experience that you want to share, please let me know by tweeting at Ethan D. Smith or visiting EthanDSmith.com. For those of you still here, there is one other question that I wanted to ask Greg, given his history. All right, so one last one. What has been your favorite place that you've lived? Come on, is that really obviously Hawaii? Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Okay, I didn't want to just assume. <laughs> so, so what you, was that? What was that like living there? I mean, it. Everybody has a has kind of this preconception about what it must be like to live in Hawaii. So, mm-hmm. well, it it definitely is a tropical resort, and it's a beautiful place to live, no matter what. Um, it's not so much that. Hawaii is very different from what people would think. So much as that there's, it's a lot richer than just the tourism. Um, the daily, the daily life of the everyday people is kind of something I really tap, like really enjoyed about Hawaii. I mean, we go back and we see all the beautiful places. Like we went at the end of my first year in grad school, and what I enjoyed more so than going to the beaches and. The other touristy spots was just going back to where we used to live and going back to Mililani and seeing the the church that we used to go to, uh, checking out the place that we used to get donuts and Sundays after church, and just you know just driving around where we used to live. That was really the cool part about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>